Well, here we are here back, uh, not live today. I'm so used to saying that here, but we are live with Mike here in the present recording this. No intro today. We're going to get right into everything. Mike Mitchell, UFL Insider with Sports Illustrated. Uh, my only plug off the top, if you enjoy the work that we do here, like and subscribe, thumbs up the video. We're about 100 subscribers away. We get 3,500, two free tickets to the UFL Championship game. It's looking more and more like I am going to be able to attend that. So that is exciting. But two free tickets, like and subscribe, get us over that hump. We are here today. Uh, one week following the UFL kickoff, I was in Arlington. Mike was on the show. Uh, we have Mike Mitchell. Mike, we have a ton of uh, listener, viewer submitted questions. We're going to get to all of those. I have them all bookmarked. First and foremost, we're, we got week one in the can. What do you make of everything thus far with UFL? It was a lot of fun. Like uh, as a fan, as somebody who follows these leagues, writes about them, I enjoyed every one of the games. I think, you know, there were some hiccups here and there. But I think overall, it was a lot of exciting plays, a lot of plays that went viral. A lot of cool finishes, some some unique aspects to the league. I think it can only get better from here. I enjoyed the broadcast. I've always been one of my uh, favorite things about the USFL broadcast the last couple of years is that I'm a huge Joel Klatt fan, big Kurt Menefee guy, and I like the Fox aspect. I know sometimes some people feel that maybe it's a little too much NFL-ish, but uh, I think those guys are so knowledgeable. Joel Klatt is terrific. If you're someone who's a casual fan who doesn't follow these leagues and you actually listen to Joel Klatt, he's breaking down the tendencies of these teams the last couple of years. So um, what Birmingham likes to do on third down, what they typically do on defense, John Chavis's blitz packages, et cetera. It's just like if you're a casual fan who doesn't know much about these leagues, if you're listening to one of those broadcasts, um, uh, Clack can teach you a lot. He can get you uh, abreast of the situation. So I, overall, I like the the opening week. I think there's room for growth and improvement there. And uh, we made it to this point. And, uh, and I'm, I'm glad both these leagues have united. And, uh, and hopefully they can build from this season. It's going to be a fun ride. Yeah, I, I've done a couple. I was on Rod Peterson's show uh, today as we record this and a couple other podcasts this week. My, I, I think it went about as well as you could expect, right, for a new league opening. I mean, obviously, this isn't really, you know, it's a new league, but it's whatever. But to me, it just makes sense. Like, this feels like how it should have been all along, right? If Fox and, you know, Redbird and kind of had all got their act together three years ago, you know, you got games on Fox, you got games on ESPN, we're promoting, Pat McAfee's talking to the players on Monday. It just, it, it feels like this is kind of the, the prince that was promised here a couple of years ago. We're getting here. Sure. And kudos to Ben Fisher, by the way, he had a fantastic article last week leading into the week one of the UFL season where he kind of gave background. I mean, this is stuff that I reported in the past, uh, how Fox tried to buy the XFL out of bankruptcy and Redbird and Danny Garcia and Dwayne Johnson kind of beat them to it. And how, the you know, Ben Fisher, to his credit, got quotes from Jerry Carr now, from, uh, I believe, Tim Reed from Disney, from Eric Shanks, of course, with Fox. And they talked about they had wished they had gotten together earlier, sooner. And, uh, you know, it might have been a different world. We wouldn't have had this particular setup if Fox and Redbird had just bought the XFL and then waited it out and, you know, brought out the league and all that. So here we are. You know, it's the, the you know, it's we might not have had the Birmingham Stallions and and all this. Who knows what teams we would have had if they were just bringing back XFL from the grave again uh, in 2020. So um, it, I'm glad these entities are together. You know, Fisher also noted something that's very interesting. I kind of flew over people's heads. And that they told him and they, they wouldn't lie to him that Disney has partial ownership of this league as well. Now, nobody knows quite the breakdown, but I think that's fascinating to have Disney, Fox, Redbird, Danny Garcia, Dwayne Johnson, all as uh, owners of this league. It, it begs a lot of questions, you know, because in, in the past, like these kind of leagues, the big thing is like, oh, can we get a TV rights deal? But if you're the actual networks that own the league, you're there's no need for a TV rights deal. That's your in-house league right there. It's all about getting sponsorships, uh, you know, obviously attendance, selling merchandising, selling off the franchises. Uh, so, I mean, the, it kind of eliminates the equation of, oh, I hope the UFL can get 50 million a year or 40 million a year or whatever it is. Right. And so, because the networks already own them. So they're covering all the costs, production and, every, and, and paying for the expenses. And so it's a little bit of a different dynamic, excuse me, <clears throat> if the networks own the league. Um, we'll get to, oh, so as we talk through attendance ratings, all that today, cause we have questions for all that. It's your understanding right now. And, and I know you talked about this on the pre-show that we did, you know, thank you for calling in for that, that busy Saturday. We're kind of getting through this year. 
and then it feels like we're on the kind of a two year window right now, right? As we look at attendance, everything, we're not going to freak out if next week we drop. Cause I'll ask you here about T you know, TV. Radio. Sure. Is that kind of your understanding that we're at least. On yeah. I've, year? I've had talks with people directly in the UFL, uh, higher up several people. And I know a lot of them have been kind of instructed to like, kind of, um, uh, not let uh, loose lips sh sink ships kind of deal. But you know, from what they told me, is that um, they feel like this is a new launching point for them and that the real test will come in 2025. Their expectation is that they'll get their footing this year, their expectations are modest, and that they'll build towards next year. And I think, and I've mentioned this throughout this whole process, um, both the leagues have merged because I don't think either side, and they'll never say this publicly, and I know this to be the case, they uh, did not see the light at the end of the tunnel and they feel by uniting together, by coming together, they can potentially, because we, it, the facts are out there for anybody who wants to seek them out. Fox has been trying to rope in investors into the league and sell off franch franchises for going on now year number three. They've hired both Fox and Redbird have hired prestigious investment firms to raise money. They haven't been successful in that end. So um, I think they're doing this because they both, they're obviously very bullish about the concept of, of running and operating your own league. They think the concept is strong enough. Fox was so impressed with the XFL in 2020. That's why they stayed in this spring pro football game uh, with the USFL. So um, I definitely think that 2024 is the launching point to 2025. And then when we get to there, because everybody, you know, I speak to people in uh, even in Canada, I've spoken to, you know, I've been on, Can like you, you are on uh, with Peterson there. I've been on uh, Canadian shows. I've talked to Canadian agents, coaches, and they ask me, Mike, what do you think? Like, do you think this is really going to last? Because everybody's skeptical, you know, nobody will be surprised if this doesn't make it right. Because we, we know the history, right? The graveyard is littered with these leagues. Um, but they all asked me that. And I told them this merger has bought them two years. What happens beyond that? We shall see. Uh, so ratings came out this week, uh, you reported, and I like to kind of preface like while we do this, cause we still live and die by all this every week. I'm like, Oh, it went up two points. It went down two points, but you know, just to kind of, I like having the stage set here. Like we're, we have a little bit of a, of a, of a runway here. It's not like, you know, it's got to hit a certain benchmark here by week three or else this thing's kind of falling apart, but you reported the ratings, right? We had one point like three the high 1.3 for the Fox and the secondary game on that 1.1 1 .1, and then 900 and 800,000. What was your reaction to that? And then they all have the questions here uh, from the listeners for everything else. What was your reaction to the TV ratings? I know you wrote about it on Sports Illustrated. Yeah, it was a stressful Tuesday morning. I can't tell you how many messages I get from people. What's the ratings, Mike? Where, where are the ratings? Where are the ratings? Are you going to report it? Uh, I, I got a couple messages like, where are you going to get your ratings from now? And this, this whole time I've been getting them from Nielsen. And, you know, full disclosure, this, has, this is not tied in completely. But I used to be part of a Nielsen home way back in the day it's kind of a unique science it's not an exact science yeah. the way they measure audiences like you're responsible if you're a nielsen home you're responsible for that particular region so like if i'm watching i don't know walking dead all of a sudden my entire neighborhood is registered yeah. as watching walking dead you know so it's not quite exact science and i you know i'm a little old school but there are so many different measurements now between streaming and out of home viewership that's not really calculated in so i was that tuesday morning was stressful waiting for the numbers from nielsen from fox um there are a lot of great people out there due to ratings um uh you know austin carp and uh the, Sports Media Watch, Sports TV Ratings, all these guys. And then I get those numbers, and then I was surprised when I got them. Um, I, I had a feeling, because even though this is a new entity and you consider it a new league, I see it as a, a bit of a carryover from what we've already seen. So I was a little bit uh, lukewarm on how much appeal this would have for people watching. And then you throw on top of the fact that it's Easter weekend. And then of course the heavy competition that's out there now, I mean, women's basketball has become so popular now too. That's really changed in the last couple of years. And then of course, NCAA doing what they do and then all the MLB stuff, et cetera. So the landscape is very difficult. So when I saw the numbers, 1.1 million, 1.3 million. I said, wow. I said, and you know, I had a couple of people in the UFL reach out to me because they read my article, Sports Illustrated, and they gave me a little bit of a hard time of undershooting them um, because I thought they would do in that 800K range. So they exceeded. That doesn't mean I'm like absolutely correct. Although 
Uh, I had people in the industry who read my predictions article and they thought I was spot on. So when I saw the 1.1 million, 1.3 million, I said, okay, wow, they, they, they did a little bit better than I thought they would. Um, and then the Sunday numbers to me were impressive too. You've got that early start in San Antonio, 11 a.m. start, and they do nearly a million viewers um, on that. And that's pretty impressive at 12 noon Eastern to do that. And then they did 700. And, you know, that game was kind of slow. Admittedly, the Memphis Houston game, it wasn't, it came at the end, there was a little bit of uh, drama involved because the game was close and there was a chance for Houston to steal one, but uh, it wasn't as sexy as some of the other games. But um, I thought the numbers were very respectable. What's going to happen now is you're going to see the ratings go down. I think the reason why you're going to see the ratings go down, and I'm sure that there'll be plenty of narratives out there of how the league tanked and look, it's so typical and all that, but they're running into a buzzsaw this weekend. So again, um, I'm very tame in my predictions. I mean, they're, they're going to be going up against the final four women's championship. They're going up against WrestleMania too, which I find that there's a lot of fans of these leagues that are also fans of the WWE and WrestleMania is a uh, once a year event. It's huge. It's two days. You got the rock wrestling in the main event. Yeah. So though, and so I think those are going to take those, Different elements are going to take away viewers from the league. The key is going to be the follow-up. Once March Madness goes away, sure, there's other leagues, NBA, NHL, all that. Uh, they'll do their thing. But I think this league, because it has so many games on big network television, will by default when the season ends. I guess these leagues last year, although it wasn't an apples-to-apples -apples comparison, they were what, like in that 600, 700,000 range, whatever it was for the year. I think this league will do better just because they have more big network games. So by default, yeah. their yearly average will be better. And like they always do. The first week is the highest. The championship game is the highest, and we've seen that. To their credit, USFL and XFL, we've seen their highest-rated games take place. Their champ at least they're able to retain some of the audience that they have or close to it when their championship game arrives. So the next few weeks are going to be very telling. I think there's going to they're going to take a little bit of a hit this coming weekend, but how far of it that remains to be seen. Well, and also like WrestleMania is huge this year, especially. I mean, rest, you know, some and I've I've been a wrestling fan off and on my entire life, and. You know, not all WrestleMania, you know, Miz, Cena, Ford Fielder, you know, not all, not all WrestleManias are the same level, but uh, this has really been built into that, especially with the two day nature of it. Uh, uh, quick follow up, and then we'll get in uh, the where you're talking about it being a continuation versus like a new league launching. I think that that helps maybe not have as much of a of a drop next week, where maybe it's actual generated interest versus like, oh, this is a new league, let's go check it out. Like I think like it's not like they've been marketing this for 10 years, pushing to this date and everyone, and then they're going to turn away. Like I, I think be, it being a continuation might lend a little bit more to like, this is the, actually the level of people that are invested in that. Does that make right. sense? No, definitely. They developed a niche audience. So the question with these leagues is I think they have, I know there's a lot of people who are detractors of these leagues. I think they've developed a nice floor. The question with them is how far can they get their ceiling? And everybody I've talked to is, you know, been, and I get it, has been skeptical about whether or not they can reach a larger ceiling. And I know the idea of these two leagues coming together is let's own this space together and perhaps we put our efforts together and we can reach that light at the end of the tunnel that I was talking about earlier in the conversation. So I do agree, Reed. I think there's a chance. We'll see what happens with this weekend. But I think they've developed. See, this is the cool thing about the USFL and the XFL now is you have established identities with these teams and leagues. There is legitimate fan bases for them. And it's like watching a show, like season three of a show, season two of a show. So they're there. They have like, they have identities. This isn't like just some random new league where you don't know the players. There are guys like the Luis Perez the Jordan Tiamos. We all know the Skip Holtz's, the Bob Stoops there. So the audience that's been around for these leagues the last few years is along for the ride. So you got a dedicated group, May not be as large as other sports leagues, but I, I think that can stabilize and keep the question in the long run is the ceiling. How high can they go? Can they get higher? Because we haven't seen leagues in this space perform like the XFL did in 2020, um, even though that league was getting trash for their ratings. But I remember on Twitter where I would every week post sports ratings comparisons and the XFL was beating a lot of leagues. I couldn't do that with the USFL in 2022. I couldn't do that with the XFL in 2023. But I remember some of my most uh, 
uh, viewed tweets and, and my little whatever six year run now on Twitter um, were, were those sports because a lot of people were crapping on the XFL's ratings. I said, oh, yeah. So I would put NBA on NBC, the NHL on ABC, and then compared it. And it was funny, you know, like the XFL was beating the NFL Combine. It was like the NFL Combine, the XFL led into the NFL Combine, and uh, the XFL got a better rating. I, mean, I know it's different. I know it's guys in shorts. I get it. Uh, versus an actual game, but still, right? So, so anyhow, but uh, I, I think uh, the ceiling is the key on this. Have they developed a decent enough floor? I think they have a good product. I think it's a good TV product. I think it can get better. Uh, you know, and when you put it into context too, like Seattle, our like our regional sports is like completely bottomed out. Our our the network that carries like the Mariners and the Kraken, like to put it into perspective, you know, I watch the Kraken every week. You know, this full blown production, they got big stars doing the commentary, all that. I think Root averages like 13, 15,000 a game, you know, so it's like really puts in, you know, when, when the XFL pops off 1.3 million versus, you know, this is right. not that I know that you hate hockey and not this. this, this I don't hate hockey. I don't hate, I don't dislike hockey. I'm just, I'm as football as football gets over the years. I've become more of a casual fan of all the other leagues yeah. and, but uh, football is the one thing where I'm diehard. Yeah. Uh, all right, Eugene wants to know what has been the league's reaction uh, to ratings versus expectations, uh, especially given the competition March start. They're happy. Uh, like I said, I got needled a bit because I said they would do 800K and they ended up doing 1.3 and 1.1 million. So I got you know, a couple friends of mine were kind of like teased me about that. Um, they're happy with it. I, you know, are there some people within the leagues that maybe feel that? Uh, they could have done a little bit better, I suppose, but I I haven't communicated with those individuals because the way I look at it is they really, you got to understand, like there was a lot of consideration about this league starting in February or starting the week after the Super Bowl, and but they just didn't have time to pull that off. Next year's timeline might be a lot different than this was, so they went right. They went right smack right in the middle. Usually what we get with like, say, the XFL starting in February, the AEF is although the AF didn't get a chance to finish the deal, neither did the XFL in 2020. But what ends up happening is by week four, week five, week six, you can afford to take a hit with your league. You know, if you're going directly against March Madness, you're like, all right, I'll take our lumps for a few weeks. They'll go away. And then at the end of our season, we'll build up to the playoffs and we'll do better then. But to debut launch this league week one against it, right in the heart of it, right in the wind of the storm, so to speak, um, that's a tough one. So they were really pleased. The people I spoke to were really pleased that, um, that they were surprised that the, some people were surprised by the numbers and, um, they were uh, attendance too. Cause like, you know, they, I know they're really, uh, prideful about how hard they're working. And I, I can see a lot of the teams are doing $15 deals and all these different deals. And they're trying to, you know, give doing a free ticket giveaways and all this stuff. They're really trying to rope in people. So they didn't really have a lot of time to make this work. I know we've heard that excuse before, but I think, you know, the true measurement for a lot of this stuff, the ratings and attendance is really going to come a year from now. But so far to answer the question, they're pleased with what they've seen. Well, especially that second game going up against Caitlin Clark and all of that. And that was, you know, 12.9 million. I mean, it completely blows the water out of, you know, everything that's really sure. come in that space before. Uh, Abdul wants to know, uh, what is the percent chance, speaking of the start, the percent chance of the 2025 season starts earlier in mid-February based on Reed's conversation with Daryl, it feels like it's heading towards that. Yeah, I think the discussion was initially for them to be after the Super Bowl. There are so many arguments for and against that. One of the arguments, there's a couple different arguments. Well, if you launch after the Super Bowl, you don't obviously run into what they're running into now, which March Madness and all that. You also run into a situation where you're in the dead of winter, where you have more people that are at home. So there's an argument for that. Um, if you your timeline is later, you run into the spring and summer where more families are, are outside and they're not at home early Saturday afternoons or doing things, you know. So then, um, and then of course, agents and players prefer for their players, for their season to wrap up before NFL teams have mini camps and, and all that. So it gives it, like we saw last year, both leagues have quality talent, but the XFL ended up having 69 players that signed with uh, the NFL and signed NFL contracts, not counting all the mini camp invite guys. So 69 signed and then 42 signed on the USFL side. So that's 111 players total. So you can still get a good amount of players if your season ends in June and July, as evidenced by the 42. 
But um, hey, 69, 42, or 27 more opportunities there. So, so I mean, agents and players want to have a better opportunity to get in the NFL. You got 35 players right now from the XFL and the USFL in 2023 that are currently rostered in the NFL. So 30% of the players that signed ended up in the league. We'll see if they make it for next season. But they, hey, they got a job in the NFL, so that's you know part of the goal of these leagues, even though they don't want to be a straight up developmental league. So as far as the calendar goes, I think they're going to debate it percentage wise. I don't know. You know, it's like I said, there's an argument for waiting until April. There really is. Um, you know, here's the thing though: if they add more teams, they're also you know, and I know we don't we well we expansion. have. Well, that expansion is expansion is talked about too much i know but if they add more teams that extends your season so if you have let's just hypothetically if they have 10 teams next year or 12 or whatever that extends your season you have more you have more games during the week on television too you'll have five six games a week on tv rather than the four that they have now but um but that would ex theoretically extend your season as well so maybe if you start earlier you can you know end uh, may june or something like that yeah, because if you add teams and then, yeah, then you're starting late and then you're going late after that. Um, we Eugene has a follow-up. Any talk consideration from the leagues now reverting to the XFL kickoff now that the NFL will use it? I know we talked about it a little bit on the pre-show uh, at the end of the stream, but I, I'm surprised they didn't about – I mean, I know that we've, we've been practicing in training camp for four weeks, but I'm surprised almost that they didn't do that. Uh, having watched the USFL kickoff again now, I, I – Greg Parks did a complete breakdown about like all the game, you know, the given yards and all of that. Do you think they move back to that next year, the XFL style? That's fascinating. I've been watching the USFL for a while now, obviously, and their kickoff is just interesting to me. Like a returner will have 15 yards with what you you'll see a returner run for 10, 15 yards without a defender even getting in the picture. You can argue whether that's a good thing or not. It's fun to watch returns like that, you know, and all that. You saw the opening kickoff of the season. The uh, Arlington's already in enemy territory. I I think. Honestly, I think the UFL is going to play it out and watch how it works in the NFL first before they do an about face. Because here's the thing, right? I, I do think the NFL is going away from, unfortunately, they're going away from the traditional kickoff. It's because of safety. We've seen what they've done. They neutered the kickoff to begin with. No wedges, none of this, different alignments, et cetera. So it sounds only 22% of kickoffs are returned, right? And, and you've eliminated injuries, but you've eliminated the play. But I think the, uh, the NFL – is only signed up for one year with this kickoff. I'm so fascinated to watch, see what happens, um, how NFL teams adapt to it, how it comes off. There's going to be people in the preseason, week one of the NFL season, that are going to look at this radical-looking kickoff and think, this is ridiculous. Just go back to the old one. There will be people that go, hey, do you, why don't you just use the UFO one? That was pretty cool. They move the kicker back, and you still get returns, right? So you get that argument too, right? So I think if it's not a disaster, you know, because the NFL has some differences from the XFL kickoff. Obviously, they're trying to paint it as their own. It's Sam Schwartzstein's baby. But they do have some differences, like the, how many people are up front. I think it's seven versus nine. Obviously, two returners rather than one. So there are some uh, – so maybe those tweaks will make the kickoff a little more exciting. I don't know. I know Sam Schwartz and his team tried a bunch of those things already. So uh, the trial by fire, I guess. But if let's just say it's a, it's it's crapped on by the critics. The NFL kickoff is just nobody's like this is ridiculous. Go back to the old kickoff. Then the UFLs be like, hey, we, we made the right decision by not going to that kickoff. But if it's a smashing success in the NFL and it's fun and there's a lot of returns and big plays and we, you know, not every play is just, you know, the kickoff in the NFL is like, I'm watching to see how strong it's like a, like an exhibition, watch and see how strong the kicker's leg is. See if you can get it through the uprights. So it's like, you know, it's like the guys, the returner just walks away as the ball goes through the end zone. So it's like, it's become a nothing play in the NFL. So there, uh, I think they could go back to it, but I think they're going to react upon what happens in the NFL. If the NFL loves the kickoff and they're like, this is it, we're, we're this, as far as we go, this is our kickoff from here on in. Then I think other people, not only the UFL, I think college football will follow suit. I mean, you got the European League of Football is doing it. I think the CFL who's looking at it, if they, if it's a smashing success in the NFL, the CFL will have it. So you'll have all levels of football using it. But first things first, let's see how the NFL implements it and how it works in their league first. Yeah, if the CFL takes it over that, that would, that would really be, you know, this illustrious of that. Uh, Peter, Texas Pete wants to know, uh, you, uh, 
What's the status on selling teams as franchises? Are there any conversations about what that would cost or look like? And I guess to add to that for mine, you talked about Disney and Fox kind of owning equity in this right now. So maybe there's not as like, okay, we got to sell tomorrow. So does that change any of that? And, and I guess, how does any of that update now that we have all of this new kind of, you know, mishmash of all this ownership? Yeah. You know, all the markets they chose, uh, they chose, they chose specific for this merger. They chose specifically because they have designs on specific potential investors. I think I've heard, for the longest time now that Memphis is uh, a city that uh, they feel is going to have maybe perhaps the league's first owner. So that's one of the things I've heard um, at Birmingham, Michigan. There's also like hope there. Like all these teams were chosen specifically, you know, the surviving USFL teams with the idea of them being sold off. And I think I've heard a lot of rumblings about Memphis. So um, I, I wouldn't be, here's the thing. It's very difficult to get eight good owners. Um, you can get one or two of them, but um, you know, and, but it's like, it's very difficult. So we saw what happened with the AAF. So like, you know, it's not, it's not an easy task, but um, I, I think there's a good chance that, you know, if this league has success in the next two years, I think there's a good chance we're going to see at least one or two of the franchises sold off to local ownership. You would hope, like, why wouldn't you want to own St. Louis? We saw you tweeted it out, the Battle Hawks beating out the Cardinals in the ratings, how well they did locally uh, up against Caitlin Clark and all that. And then so um, why wouldn't you, if you're in St. Louis, consider owning the Battle Hawks? So, um, you know, it, it's uh, and you you figure the stallions by now. That was the hope of Fox that somebody in Birmingham would step up, right? You'd figure we'll see how their attendance is. It's a crucial week for some of these teams. The expectations are modest for attendance, but I think the threshold for a lot of these teams is 10k and above. So try to shoot for that. The big thing with these games too is that you want, and I think they all had good crowds. I think you want whoever shows up, no matter what the number is, 10, 12, 14,000, you want energized crowds that are into it. That crowd sounded great in Michigan. You know, it wasn't the biggest crowd. And the crowd was decent in Houston, all things considered, right? Um, their team didn't look very good, but they I, I thought the energy level was good there. San Antonio was, you know, pretty good too. So I, I thought, I think that's um, these markets, how they do if they start to take off, Um um, if they have good seasons at the gate, Birmingham, Memphis, Michigan improve from last year. Um, I think there's a chance maybe they can. I mean, that's the ultimate goal outside of the NFL stepping in and funding this league somehow. Um, that's the ultimate goal is because they've centralized it. They're all going for the MLS model. And so what they would like to do is have it centralized control costs and then owners come in and that takes care of itself. Uh, it was funny. I actually want to pull that up because uh, one of our listeners, they tagged me in that St. Louis thing. And I, I texted Max. I said, like, has this been shared yet? Like, did I miss? He's like, oh, yeah, that's been around. I'm like, oh, and I'm like, well, I'll tweet it anyway, just because I mean, it ended up a lot of people haven't seen it yet. Um, so just uh, let me see if I can. Uh, let me see if I can share this just so we can talk about it super quick. This is kind of an uh, ad lib here. Um so the TV numbers by the, the, these are the local ratings, right? For each of the teams, St. Louis beating there, you know, the 4.5 on that. Are you surprised uh, with the, with the lower numbers here for Birmingham, which this is your three of them having the team uh, with 2.6 and then Detroit 2.2 and then Dallas, you know, the central hub of the UFL uh, with a point. I mean, I know Dallas is huge. There's a lot going on. Just any takeaways on that since that's kind of new info since we've posted anything. Yeah, I'm not so obviously not surprised. It goes without saying St. Louis's number. Birmingham's number's okay. I wish it would be better. Detroit, I'm actually surprised it's that, to be honest with you, that they're, you know, to, so, and I, you would think by now that Dallas would be a little bit stronger um, for, for uh, you know, their attendance was decent. You were obviously at that game. I thought I was a little worried before the game, you know, seeing some of the photos that were out there and how the crowd was potentially going to look. And I think it filled out nicely. Um, yeah, those numbers could be a little bit better. The Dallas number could be better. The Detroit number is fine. Birmingham should be a little bit higher. Uh, St. Louis is awesome. I mean, that's so cool to see. So I, I think these, some of these, I think some lessons can be learned here in the future in terms of like, a, you know, it's probably never going to happen, but I keep looking at Oakland, which has like no pro sports teams, basically. Well, now, especially with the, I mean, the A's moving today, they're going to be playing in Sacramento. 
I just keep thinking to myself, if this league ever decides to journey a little bit differently on the calendar and maybe head to the West a little bit um, rather than just be sectioned off there, maybe Oakland will be in consideration. Because could you imagine if you had an Oakland UFL team, that entire market, there's no baseball to watch, there's none of that. And don't get me wrong, there'll be some loyalists that still follow the A's, you know, no doubt. But it's kind of hard when they abandon your city. So for Oakland to have their own football team, they lost the Raiders. I think that's something for the maybe it's cost efficient. It's not cost efficient. I don't know. But that's something to consider. You because you're looking at the example of St. Louis and uh what happens when you go to a market that's been shunned by pro football in general. And then you can see how they've embraced it. And those numbers are very impressive. And it's they're gonna hold up. St. Louis is gonna do well all season long. Uh, Robert has a question here on Facebook. Speaking of attendance, what attendance numbers do the teams need to achieve to be viable? I, we talked a little bit about that, but you know, for example, Michigan averages 9,000 per game. Will they fold for next season? I don't I mean, think you're so. running for field. Yeah. I mean, and that's the problem. Yeah. It's like you're running for, I mean, it costs a lot. Yeah. To run field. And that's a tough one. That's a tough one. So, I mean, like I said, from people I've spoken with, I think their expectations are modest in terms of attendance. I don't think they're expecting 20,000 in every venue. Um, I don't think that's the expectation there. They'd like to do better than 9,000 for sure. But you got to remember last year, like I got the figures, but I wasn't able to release it for two reasons. I could have been a jerk and released it, but I didn't want to make the USFL look bad. Um, uh, that's the honest, God honest truth. People told me not to do that. But that's I didn't want, you know, I, I understand the non-Panthers games. There was like a, a couple 989 paid fans kind of thing. So that's, you know, so I, I don't think that they're expecting 20,000 at Ford Field. I would love if they get to that point, that would be what a success. Maybe the Panthers beat the Stallions this, this week and they start proving that they're one of the best teams in the league and they start to take off. They have one of the coolest uh, helmets in the history of pro football. They have great history dating back to the old USFL. I'd love nothing more than to see that. Uh, uh, that team take off. So you never know. Maybe, maybe that market takes that team over time. Um, I don't think there's like a set marker. Like last year, if I'm not mistaken, this is off the top of my head, but I think the XFL sold 600,000 tickets. Now, I have to double check that, but I'm pretty sure that was, uh, I have to double check, but I, I I'm pretty sure it was in that neighborhood in terms of how many tickets they sold for the season. So this league could do better than that. Um, uh, I have no doubt about that. And if you look at if you look at the um, – because last year you had Orlando. They had the Vegas situation. Vegas averaged like 6,000 per game, which is a miracle that they even got that, mm -hmm. all things considered. And then Orlando was whatever it was, I think 9,000 or 10,000 thereabouts. Um, the key is paid attendance, right? So they give away a lot of tickets and, and all that stuff. The key is like how many paid. So that's important. I do think these numbers have to improve in some of these markets. Um but I think the threshold right now is like 10,000 and above. You'd like to do more. You'd like to build upon that. You'd like to do more, obviously. But I, to expect all these markets outside of St. Louis to all of a sudden be hitting 20K, by now Birmingham should. Birmingham is such an awesome team. By now they should be. They're, they're, gonna tr they're trying to attempt to win the third straight championship. That's something that hasn't happened in pro football since the Packers in the 60s or the Edmonton Elks in the late 70s, early 80s. I know people look at these leagues differently, but it's professional football. So, um, I mean, so by now, Birmingham should be embracing the team. So you would hope that they, they, I have, my expectation for them is higher than, than it is for say Michigan or what have you. I think they should do 14, 15, 16,000 and above. Um, they shouldn't be in that eight, nine, 10,000 range, in my opinion. These other teams have to build up a winning tradition and build up their fan base. I think by now, Stallions in year three should be doing better. It's funny because uh, you we talk attendance and you get the there was a CFL guy over the weekend, you know, posting the average attendance for all the CFL franchises last year. It's like, it's 110 years versus one week here, like, but just, just to be whatever. But because you're, but to, to piggyback off that, and then I have another question about uh, from Darren here about the attendance. You know, you talk about ownership. We talk about franchise ownership, and like, you know, I have not looked at the seating charts for this weekend. I've heard Memphis is pretty low. I know they're running ten dollars ticket sales, and you want like, but yeah, if I'm buying the Memphis franchise with 
you know, 4,500 paid attendance, 6,000 paid. Like, what am I buying at that point? And I know we talk about TV ratings and all that. I think it was Ben Fisher that was on last year with the sports business show that was talking about, you know, you can't evaluate an MLS franchise that's, you know, getting a million viewers each week the same as you can, you know, USFL franchise because you have season tickets and you have, you know, hundreds of years, you know, the people and then the buying the merchandise and the families and they're passing this on and kind of the, even just like your the mental kind of, um, like hold you have in the communities and there's all these other intangibles that go into it. So I guess, you know, it, it, like if Memphis looks really weak this weekend in terms of attendance, like I don't know what you're buying there in terms of like a franchise. It's tough too with like football seasons because it has to go beyond the ticket sales in terms mm -hmm. of your revenue, because it's not like, you know, we see baseball games with three, four, five, six thousand fans, but they got a 81 home games, right? So they can make up some money along the way there, you know, so they can by doing that. These teams have five games. That's it. And yeah. then, you know, if they, if they get to the playoffs, maybe they host the game, you know, maybe they get to six or whatever. But um, yeah, you have to be somebody in Memphis that figures with my money, with my promotional ability, I can market this team because the, the league is not willing for, for better or for worse, they're not because they know they can go into the red rather quickly. They're not willing to go all out on spending money on promotion and marketing. So for, for better or for worse, and a lot of leagues in the past tried this and they ended up, you know, going in the red immediately. So you're going to need an owner that sees the, that is bullish on it, that sees the potential and goes, you know what? If I take control of the showboats, I will boost attendance. I know exactly what to do in this market. So you're going to need those type of like forward thinking, maybe egotistical, brave guys that come into the market because you're not going to buy a ready-made smashing success product. You're going to need people who are like innovative and can they feel like they have a handle of the marketplace and they can benefit from owning one of these teams. You know, because, yeah, and then, like, am I getting a percentage of the shop sales for the, you know, like, how does that go? And I mean, there's so many, you know, like, how does that go all in when you have central ownership? I mean, I know MLS has all that stuff. Um, Darren wants to know, what do, you, what do you think is more important, TV numbers or live attendance numbers? I think TV numbers are more important because I think the more of an audience you can build, the more sponsors you'll get, and the more popular your product is on television. The, your attendance will improve. So I think I think that's a, a, a very important aspect is you're know, building up your popularity on television because you become more visible and then you sell more tickets. So by default, so I think they go hand in hand. I think the big thing with these football leagues is they have to figure out, and you know, Jerry Cardinal, I've seen him, you, you know, listen to him speak on many different forums. He's talked about you know, monetizing, how do you monetize the fan base when they're not at the games? And that's a big, that's a thing that these leagues haven't quite figured out yet, whether it be through fantasy, gambling, merchandising. So they haven't quite figured out like, how do we, cause you, you have to be able, and for a football league to be successful, make a lot of money, you have to be able to profit off of beyond just a three hour window that your game is on. Um, that's where they need to figure out. They need to build up their revenue stream. So they're all important. Each one of these um, things is important. Sponsorships. But I would say if I had to lean one way or the other, I think the, the ratings are, are a little more important than the attendance. I think your ratings, it's funny how it works, though. I think your ratings improve, too, if people turn on the TV and they see people in attendance, right? Because then they see it's a hot product and this is interesting and let me watch it. And this crowd is awesome. And look how amped up they are. And it it enhances the game. That's what the USFL, um, unfortunately, they have so many great elements that the league lacked is their games had artificial energy with the piped in crowd noise and all that. And, you you know, if you flipped it on, you go, oh, my God, nobody's had these games. It's like so. And then you would just change, you know. So anyhow, so they kind of all work hand in hand. But I would lean towards the TV ratings. Something just uh, got in my mind. Did you watch? I was traveling. Did you watch the UFL today? I'm looking here on the ESPN. It got about 12,000 viewers on the ESPN YouTube channel talking about, you know, Destroying's, uh, you know, debut and kind of all that stuff. Did you watch that? I did watch it. You know, there are aspects of that show that, you know, it's very sleek looking. I like Scooby. I'm a fan of Daniel Dopp. I've listened to him with the uh, field Yates do fantasy football. Um, they, they try to do an interactive thing with the fans. I, I think there's a, a great gem of an idea there. It looks sleek, very professional. I, I don't think they're quite hitting on it. Um, 
it's trying to be hip and you know the guys are walking around with the the the, the pads and all yeah, that yeah, and, they're, yeah. and they're doing and I, I think this show if it finds its groove it can be very formidable it's very up to date leaning into technology interactivity with fans i love the concept of it like i said i like the people that are working on the show i did see it i thought it was good i, I just my expectation level i think it could be so much better um than what it is i mean it it has potential i think it'd be a very entertaining show they'll have guests and stuff and that'll help i think they need a little bit more of exclusive access with like players and coaches and all that, which we get a lot of, we take it for granted. Now I've been watching the XFL and the USFL. We take for granted all this like access. It's ridiculous. We never see this during NFL games. Like I was watching, I just wrote an article, defenders article, and I watched it. Reggie Barlow was ripping on Brandon Smith. Um, because Brandon Smith was on the sideline saying, you're not throwing me the ball. You're not throwing me the ball. They draw up a play on third down for him. He drops it. And the DC has to punt the football. And then Reggie Barlow's on screen saying, um, you you beg for the ball, we throw it to you, and you drop it. Good going. You know, that kind of deal. I'm like, ooh, that stuff, you just don't. I know NFL Films does some great work, and then after the fact, you see some stuff. But some of it, you have to question how much of it is cleaned up for television yeah. and how much yeah. is, you know, like they make sure we don't hear any read, call somebody a jerk or an asshole. So that kind of thing. So, but – um. But I think there's some of that element that I think the the UFL Today Show can benefit from, you know, the the extra added access. Um, and um, I, I think it, it's a work in, like the league sometimes, in some respects, it's a work in progress. I think it can be better. I like what they do. I did watch it. It's available out there. They need to do a better job of promoting that it's coming up. Yeah. I like the whole idea. Like, uh, you know, they're like, like a high, I like the idea of a highlight show after the fact, you know, and, uh, and like bringing some personality and some flair to it with some cool post game reactions, some news, you know, it would, uh, I think there's potential there for it to be better than it is right now, as is, it's okay. I enjoyed it last year. There's nothing wrong with it, but I just think it can be so much better than it is. Yeah, it's just like you were talking, just ways to exist outside of just a Saturday, Sunday. I mean, I know they do it on Sunday, and that makes it, you know, do the kind of the post game, but, you know, uh, except for like these coaches' media calls. And I know like Tayamu Ta had a thing they sent out today that you could download, like, you know, trying to keep this league and the zeitgeist during the week right now is, you know, it's always kind of the problem. And I think the CFL has an issue with that sometimes. I will say, like, really good job with the YouTube channel. I mean, uh, the, the XFL one as well, posting clips and everything. I thought they've done a good job in terms of, like, you know, being able to catch up and do all that, even if the one of them is like the super cut of destroying kicks or whatever. I thought that was, that was kind of funny. Yeah. It was, uh, that's another thing. There's so many hardworking people in the league. I thought it was an impressive week on social media for the yes. weekend, especially in comparison to last year. I thought they did a very good job because last year you'd go an hour, an hour and a half. Uh, like, a, like, uh, like oh, come on, man. You've had all these cool plays. You just like, I know I'm seeing it, but the point is you have to put it out there. And then, you know, you have to show those highlights. So it's a part of the viewing experience. Now you got the phone in your hand, you're doing it for people who don't have access to TV. They anyway, but I thought they did a very good job with social media. They're doing a good job on their YouTube channel, a much better job than they did last year. There's areas for improvement. What you have to do is you have to put yourself in the shoes of a fan whenever you're doing any of these things. And you have to say, okay, as a fan, when I watch the NFL, what do I want from a post game show? Then write that down. What are what do I like from their post game show? Write that down. What are they missing? So and then I think you need to do that. You need to do that. What do I do? Like the XFL social media teams, these special teams, they have to if they're NFL fans, they have to sit there and go, what do I do on Sunday mornings when NFL games are about ready to go? About an hour and a half, they have a routine of going to see the inactives. Every team posts them. Why can't we do that? So I mean, every team posts their injury report every day. So you, I, it's not a bad thing to copy. Uh, I, I had the NFL. There's some things, right? Because there's stuff they don't do right. The NFL, and you can see it in the UFL because the UFL with the transparency, with the review, all that stuff, it's ahead of the game. With the technology they use, with the first down marker, that's way ahead of the game. The access they give the UFL, XFL, USFL have given you on the sidelines with players. That's a, you'll. I don't know if we'll ever see that in the NFL, like players being interviewed during the game. It's so cool. I think it's cool. I know a lot of people traditionalists don't like it. I think it, it, you don't always get great moments. I know, but I think it's cool that right after somebody makes a big player or, or you know, the crazy thing is they didn't really, the old school XFL would have went to Gene Delance and would have went right in his face and said, why'd you spit on that player? 
and they would and that would have made for a heck of a television but i guess they avoided that they kind of oh. interviewed de destroying but i mean um hey it's part of the game so anyhow uh these right uh, i got a lot of like heat on that i'm like you if you like what's his name uh day, day, what's day, day low hey day low hey like, donald day low hey donald i'm like if you it's fine i just i don't it's, 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 well I don't here's know. the thing with here's the thing with him and i get it i give him total credit for building up the yeah, social sure. media deal that he's built up that's awesome i would never be able to do that i don't know how he did it good for him i know he got in trouble for it in college football so that's yep. kind of it. The world has changed a lot now with the NIL. So I think it's cool that he came out the other side. I think it's also kind of cool. I know he was with the Toronto Argonauts on their practice roster a few years back. I think it's cool that he's getting an, an opportunity. He's got to deliver when he's given the opportunity. He didn't do very much. Um, and I know they, they're building him up because he has a following. I get it. But when he gets the chance, he's got to deliver. Now, he didn't have to do anything in that game uh, for the Brahmas, who had a great debut. But um, under that new regime, mm -hmm. but um, but we'll see. He's got to come through. He's getting a golden opportunity. He got a golden ticket here. League's giving him. It helps him that he's got that social deal, that he's got that popularity. It's an interesting story. But if he falters, you know, I mean, uh, you know, then he's got to produce when he's given the chance to make field goals and to help his team win. He's got to come through. Otherwise, it's good. there are going to be people who think of it as a publicity stunt until uh, proven otherwise. Yep. Uh, so we've avoided uh, asking this question. Here we go. Uh, Pip wants to know, uh, Mike, what are your thoughts on adding teams after year one? How many teams should they add? We're gonna, oh. Well, you got to touch on it. Yeah, yeah, sure, sure. Absolutely. Expansion. They expansion um they discussed having 10 teams and then i'm not surprised i know there was a big controversy on this i'm not but surprised going in going into this season they going into this yeah. season i'm sorry yeah. yes they discussed having 10 teams they came close a couple occasions they decided upon eight for this year then revisit it for next year so i think there's a good chance i would say better than 50 50 that we get two new teams in the league next season um, I, I, I doesn't mean now there was some controversy attached to this because, you know, the recent trademarks, the Ohio Bulldogs, the Nashville Tuners. I do know that if there wasn't a merger that the Vegas Vipers were either, either headed to Nashville or to Arizona. So make of that what you will, whether they would have been the Nashville Vipers or the Nashville Tuners, who knows? But, um, Tuners but and, is it, is it, that's, you, I don't is know. There history that's, with that? Is there history? Not that I can recall. See, I that's maybe I'm like that is a terrible thing. The, the only way I'd sign off on that is if you tell me right now they have a Nashville owner that wants that crazy yep. name. If you tell me right now, they I'll say, okay, yeah, his money's good, right? Okay, sure. Tuners, it is. Go I mean, ahead, I guess I don't know. I mean, the Jousters is the greatest spring football league of all time. I mean, maybe the tuners, I could get I, I'm changing maybe. my tuners. I'm changing my tune on the tuners. There you go. You never know. Maybe the logo, you could do the like the tune thing somehow, like looks kind of cool. I don't know. Tuning fork. Work. I, I imagine like a tuning fork, right? And we're oh, and then they could come out and make it like right. It could work, it could grow on you. I mean, there's a lot the origin behind a lot of these pro football names. I mean, the Packers are meat packers. They would name they didn't have any money that franchise, so they named it after the meat packers, the right right there locally. So they needed somebody to fund the team. So Packers it is. So anyhow, but um, maybe you never know. But Nashville and Ohio, I do know that the the idea was for Vipers to go to Nashville, Arizona, and I do know that uh Canton just missed the cut. So um I put Ohio, a picture of the tuning for yeah. us so we can get an idea. Yes. <laughs> it looks pretty good. They're, yeah. they're all that, that might work. I don't know. It's good. It's good. You can sell me on it because I'm like yeah. big on like it almost has like a trident look to it a little yeah, bit. A little like, bit. Yeah, you know, so anyhow, but um, but yeah, I do think this league is gonna go. I I, I you know, barring them, there's a, like if they have a horrible year at the gate and their ratings are very bad and things collapse. I could totally, and they don't have a good championship rating and they don't do very well as far as sponsorships and all that. Let's say the year's a disaster, which I don't think it'll be, but let's just say it just completely craters. It doesn't, they don't do very well. Then it's possible that they decide, well, let's just stay with eight teams again. But I really think that they came so close and, you know, people were telling me, hey, the Canton would be a part of this, right? That, and that they would have 10 teams. When they decided on eight, Ohio was on the chopping block. Um, so I do, and I'm a huge supporter uh, of, a, you know, I'd like to see him in Columbus, but anywhere in Ohio, I think it's an awesome football place. So I think that'd be very cool. 
So I think we're gonna I think we're gonna get two new teams. That's a hook, too, by the way. I think they almost kind of have to do that. They need a new hook for 2025, not just hey, we're coming back for season two of the UFL. I mean, that's cool, right? But I think the hook is we're gonna have two, we're gonna add on two teams. We'll have five weekly games. Well, I think that would be pretty cool. I think the fans want it. Fans always want expansion. It just has to be done the right way. The right choices have to be made. So, um, but I, I honestly think, I honestly think we're we're gonna add at least two teams next year. I thought that hurt the USFL going into season two. The, the you know the biggest stories were okay, Memphis is playing in Memphis and Michigan's playing in Michigan. But I did I that wasn't enough, like you said, to get like casual fans like, oh man, they're adding two new teams and like I mean. I, you know, I don't know what it's a non-zero number of people that, you know, supported the Michigan Panthers more when they were in Michigan, right. but I don't know if it was that right. Like, oh man, now that they're here, like now I'm all, I'm and there's all. always going to be people unhappy, right? Cause like, let's say they choose there's hypothetically, they choose Ohio and Nashville. There's going to be a bunch of people that go, why don't you go to San Diego? Why don't you go to Oakland? How come you don't have any in New York Northeast teams? Why don't you bring back the Maulers or the stars or the generals or the dragons or whatever? So there'll never be people that are fully happy, but I, I would be happy if you added two more teams. That means more players, more jobs, more games. Um, so I'm all for it. I, if they can, I, I think they need to have a good season this year. And like I said, not, not have an awful year at the gate, awful year in the ratings. Because if they do that, they'll come back for next year, but it'll, they'll be limping into it. Um, Eugene had, this might be a quick one. Cause we, I thought we had, he wants to know any plans on flex scheduling. I thought we had a little bit, didn't we have flex last year where we shifted time slots a little bit? Yeah. Yeah. I, I, and they do that during the season. I think that's a very good idea, especially as you get, you know, you have, I'd have to look at the schedule, but it's a very good question. I think as you get towards the end of the year, depending on what the playoff picture looks like, I think you need to flex your best games into prime time or into, uh, the windows, the ABC Fox windows. Fortunately, the league has whatever it is, 31 games on both those. But, you know, you might have two teams that are out of it and uh, they might have like the primetime game on Fox. And, the, you know, I would like to, if possible, I would like to do that. So I think they did do that. They announced ahead of time during the XFL season. Oh, by the way, we're moving this game to this time and this game to that time. So I think that's possible uh, for this season. I think you want to, ideally, you want to wait towards uh, like towards the end of the year when you get into those final few weeks of the season before you start. Cause I think everybody's still alive until you get to like week eight, week nine, week 10. And last year was crazy. We had three, four and six teams make the playoffs in these two leagues, you know? Yeah. Cause I, it was like, one of them was a sea dragon game. Cause I remember like we got the email and I was like, you know, cause we had tickets. So I like, oh, this game is going to be, you know, whatever time now uh, mirror twin wants to know, I know alt fantasy is doing their thing. I'm in the league and it's been good so far. Plans have a UFL ESPN partnership for fantasy to get some more fans involved. I mean, I know we had Daryl Johnson on, we've been talking injury reports and kind of all that stuff, but just trying to like, I just, feels to me like they never really grasped this and i we had eric eager on and uh jovan on and the, the pre-show like i would literally hire if fox doesn't have this like hire someone to do like fantasy dfs like brain trust for one of these leagues but what do you make of this and i'm trying to get these fans in yeah it's very old world thinking that they're not up on top of this you know as far as fantasy football goes i haven't heard a thing um I've reached, I've actually reached out. I've asked, I haven't heard, Hey, we plan on doing this, this next year. We plan on doing this. I think they just want to maybe develop partnerships with the popular DFS sites or what have you. I could only imagine how successful their app would be if they had how much traffic they would get. Um, if they actually had uh, fantasy football on their own app, um, if everybody would sign up. So it's and if they had injury reports on there, if they had all of oh. that on there, you could and the transactions on there. If they had all of that on there, you would get people every day checking that multiple times right. a day. Like when is multiple times? Yeah, you have to you have to think about it. Like again, put your shoes and uh, put yourself in the shoes of an NFL fan. What do NFL fans do? And that's what I do during the week. I have fan. I play fantasy football, and I pay attention to every team's injury reports, and I do all that stuff. And it's immersive. It's part of the process of being, uh, you can't wait for that first practice report. You can't wait for that first injury report. I'm not even a gambler. I pay attention to the lines too, the over, the under. It's kind of like, so that's all part of it. And I, I, I have, unfortunately, these leagues have yet to get it right. Um, you know, they, from the AAF on down, they haven't delved into it or figured this aspect out. If they, they need to get some, hire someone to do it for them um, because it just seems like an old world thinking kind of deal. 
where they don't understand none of the Jerry Cardinals not picking up running backs from the Cardinals. I very unlikely that Danny Garcia is making trades in her fantasy league. So they have no knowledge of it. They don't understand they don't the worth it, yeah. and they just do not get it. They don't understand how fantasy full. Uh, there was a time, you know, Peter King who just retired. He wrote an article for sports illustrated where, you know, 10 ways to save a boring NFL. And so and there was a time, and I remember in the early nineties, there was a time when the NFL was considered boring. And I really think that fantasy football was a big reason why the NFL started it become the monster that it is because it just made people in their markets fans of every team and show interest in every game and so um and then that's like where we're at it's a red zone and all these channels all that stuff is fun when you're playing fantasy football good lord stressful but fun well and then also you know even if the game is lost or you know it's not a competitive game anymore it gives you a reason to kind of watch all that stuff uh you know because i remember like the you know, and they even try to talk about it. This weekend wasn't a great weekend for me to do like commentator analysis because the one game we were in the press box, uh, two of the games I was at bars and then I was watching on the airplane, the other one. But, you know, they're like, oh, they, they kicked the field goal. Well, if you're betting the over on this game, like you're a happy camper. I'm like, <laughs> that, like I don't know sports betting at all. I was just on a podcast and they're like, hey, like what are your prop bets for the weekend? I'm like, I like you were asking the wrong homie for that one. But like, even I understand that there is such a large portion of that. They would, they, they, they would just watch the games just to bed and play on them. They even, they don't even care about the league at all. You know, it's funny. I had a tweet last week. Um, uh, I, I bring up his name. Matty fresh put out like the lines. So I went ahead and I replied to it and I gave whatever, like who I thought my, the favorites were. And it only had like four likes to tweet. I was thinking, ah, nobody even noticed. I said, I like Michigan and San Antonio's home underdogs. And I take Memphis outright, right? And obviously taking Birmingham. I didn't think anybody saw it or cared about it. You know how many people reached out to me and said, wow, Mike, you know so much. How did you know this was going to happen? And I'm like, what? And people who are into this are asking me my opinions on DFS. They're asking my opinions on, on prop bets, on spreads, all that. And so um, I got lucky because sometimes you're completely off. Uh, but I had a feeling about those teams covering. Yeah. I had no idea Jake Bates was going to kick a 64-yard field goal. I knew San Antonio was going to be better than people were making them out to be. And I knew D.C., especially early in the seasons when I have struggles. They lost too many big-time players. So um, it to uh, it not affect them. So anyhow, but there are people. My point is to say there are people out there that are so into this stuff and that they're waiting for you to provide this. And when they don't, they turn away from your league. So um, it's unfortunate. They just haven't quite – none of these leagues can figure it out. I don't know if it's just older people that are just older generation that don't understand it. They don't, they don't get it, but they don't understand. Like you just have to pay attention. Like you have to pay attention to what, the, what happens during an NFL season, like how immersed fans are. That's how you monetize your fan base when they're not at the games. Well, right I mean – you have entire TV shows on, you know, NFL Network now that like and I I watch NFL Network a lot. RIP Good Morning Football right now. Well, they had to figure out what the heck's going on with that. But like they have entire programs, hour long program, like getting your fantasy set of the lineups. Like, you know, it's it's such a stupid thing, but it, it is it is it's it, it, the world is invested in this now. I mean, I don't get it. I just don't, I can't justify doing right. podcasts and then playing, you know, Dorothy would divorce me, but like, it, it, it's <laughs> such a thing that like you said, for them not to understand. And my last point. And then when, when you don't provide the stuff, then these markets dry up, right? Because I remember USFL season one, I'd have people on every week because I'm like, oh, shoot, these are guys that like actually know all the football and they're taught because they got to know all this. And you get to week eight, nine, and they're like, yeah, we went from having a $100,000 pot to $10,000 pot or you know, however it works because they're like, right. just, there's not enough interest to justify doing it. It's unfortunate. but And that's the thing. That's the thing with the NFL has. Fantasy football and gambling have turned casual fans that, hey, I'll check out the NFL game when it's on Sunday to everyday fans 24 hours a day fans like they're completely bought in um and so it's a big part of it it's huge and th that information is free to give out they just have, i'm hoping that one day that they'll actually they'll have someone who comes to them and pitches them on it that has experience in the field and that can help them you know join the year 2024 because they're really way behind on that so uh, they haven't figured they 
they don't understand how much interest and traffic that'll drive if they do it. Um, yeah. I have eight guys that have been on my podcast in the last six months with, you know, and a, and a harpy and be able to revolutionize that. It's just, it's crazy. Sorry to interrupt. It's all good, but it's the truth. It's just like, and then the people who are like the Matthew Berries of the world, who I respect, the Field Yates, all these people that are, Daniel Dopp was doing, he knows all about fantasy football. You, you would, uh, he has good opinions too in that area in the NFL. Uh, Stefania Bells, these people would have more interest in the UFL if you actually had straight up fantasy football. And so, you know, um, one day, I don't know. <laughs> Uh, we got this will be rapid or this is actual football now we'll talk here rapid fire here there's multiple ones in here so we'll kind of rapid fire this and then i have a final round out question here we'll do uh federal here federal here hill i can't even speak now fryer wants to know first question houston really that bad yes here's the th <laughs> here's the thing though that what what will keep them in games this year if mark thompson's heads on correctly and he's healthy and that defense we I'm saw like they, Mark Thompson. I'm working that. Yeah. If I'll tell you that because they have a chance. Mark Thompson's the best running back in the league, and their defense is really good. Their offense put them in bad spots in week one. Memphis is so much more talented overall than they are. They still had a chance in that game. So Houston's bad, but if this makes any sense, they can be a competitive bad until they get the quarterback position correctly and figure that out. They're going to have a hard time stacking up against Case Cookus in Memphis, obviously Birmingham with, you know, Matt Corral. And so, um, and Michigan now with their defense. So uh, we'll see what happens with EJ Perry. But um, Houston is that bad because they can't right now stack up a quarterback until they figure that out. But I do think they can be competitive every week because they do have the makings of a, like the top notch run game and a really good defense. Uh, next question. How did the Rothfuss get so good? Who they got 41 new players. They got a 50 player roster. They got 41 new players. And it's not just roughnecks from last year. Yeah, they got a healthy John Trey Kirkland. That kind of helps. But if you notice some of their new imports, like Anthony McFarland, right? This, this, these guys, you know, uh, you got to give Mark Lillybridge credit. You can see a lot of like recent Marquez Stevenson, wide receiver, slot receiver, six round pick of the Buffalo Bills. Mark Lilly Bridge Bridge did a very good job yeah. putting that roster together. And I think a lot of people were overlooking what he did. And they kept thinking about last year's promise. They only have nine players. And the ones they brought back from last year, Delonte Scott, Alizé Mack, those guys are really freaking good. So uh, th you want to bring those guys back. So I think Hot San Antonio, you don't see that very often on in a football team. I know there's a lot of turnover in the NFL, but like 41 out of 50 new players – that's quite that's quite the makeover. Uh will Cookus thrive with the showboats? I think he can stay alive. He, you know, like I yeah. I, I admire his toughness. You know, he stays in the pocket up until the last second. And it, it makes me worry about him staying healthy because he waits. I love the fact that and I and, you know, you heard the announcers there, like uh Luganville was so impressed with Cookus. I think this is their first time like calling a game with him. I know they've heard of him, knew about him, but you know, I was like yeah, you guys are learning for the first time how tough this kid is. I think Cookus is like the one team, one quarterback that I trust overtaking Birmingham in the USFL conference. If he can stay healthy, Memphis has a very talented roster. Got to remember, uh, Case Cookus was in that first Stallions championship when he left the game, unfortunately, right before his wedding, when it broke his leg or whatever. They, the Stars were winning that game when he left. And then it got a craziness, whatever it was, K.J. Costello and Alex Magoo battling it out. Both starting quarterbacks got hurt. Stallions came out on top. But uh, Cookus is good, a good quarterback. Uh, if they, um, you know, they, they, they kind of slept walk through that game last week. But I think Memphis has a chance to be better. Uh, I remember getting uh, yelled at because I wasn't at the USFL championship game that season after I was working, I think, uh, four weddings in five days or whatever it was. That was always fun. Uh, what is the issue with D.C.? Oh, they lost their three biggest stars. So think about it in any sport. doesn't matter if it's football or any sport. If you lose your three best players, if you take any team in sports and just take your three best players off of it, you're going to have an issue. So I, I mean, there's no disrespect to Jordan Te'amu, who I thought had a decent week one. He was actually victimized. I think they had five drops, DC. He threw two touchdown passes that were negated because of the penalties, Mr. DeLance. See you later, sir. Um, 
So I, I think that the loss, you, two of the wide receivers are in the NFL, and Chris Blair and Lucky Jackson were fourth and fifth in the in the XFL in receiving. Their yards per catch were ridiculous. They produced so many big plays. Teams tried to put eight men in the box to stop Abram Smith, and they paid for it dearly when they did that. It was difficult to defend against the defenders. So um, Abram Smith is a huge loss. And until somebody steps up, I think the Kiki QT – Pick uh pickup was a good one. He, had, he should have had two touchdowns last week. I think uh Brandon Smith has to play better this week. Ty Scott had a nice debut, his first game with the defenders. I think that this team, you know, um, they got a wake up call and they got a huge game coming up on uh on Sunday against Houston. Uh, you know, that might be ugly. Both those teams only scored 12 points a piece last week. So DC's got a lot of pressure to keep their undefeated streak intact in in dc and to get their mojo back because they kind of lost it in that championship game to arlington that was a game they shouldn't have lost and then they you know san antonio was two steps ahead of them uh, physically and mentally last week uh does the league go through birmingham Oof. i predicted the stallions would win the whole thing so i'm obviously bullish on them i have a lot of respect for skip holtz it's kind of interesting they have 13 players from that 2022 championship team so they got a lot of big leaders from that they're trying to win their third straight championship um that staff is very good continuity helps um they're the team to beat until proven otherwise until proven they're the kings of the spring so until proven otherwise until they're knocked off the throne you got to respect the ring was St. Louis lost just bad luck, or was there something else they could have done to win? I don't know. St. Louis kind of deserved to lose that game. It's kind of crazy that they lost on a 64-yard field goal. Um, they were thoroughly outplayed at the line of scrimmage. They did not play well. Anthony Beck was ticked off after that game. Mm. Um, because they just did not they just they they their performance, they're better overall than Michigan on paper, clearly have a better offense. They missed opportunities. A.G. McCarron missed a wide-open touchdown down the field. They just were sloppy in that game. And I, I think, you know, last year they got away with that. They played some games like against San Antonio where they were out, you know, outplayed for three quarters and a half and then found a way to pull that off in the end. And they almost did the same thing in week one. A lot of pressure on St. Louis, too. Um, they got a huge game coming up with Arlington. One of those two teams is going to be 0-2 when the smoke settles on week two. Um, I don't think it was bad luck. I think – I, I know that's hard to hard to say when a team other opposing team kicks a kick sixty four yards twice, um, but they kind of the football gods were like, well, you guys don't deserve this one. Yeah. So, um, so the, I I think they kind of St. Louis at St. Louis had one last week. They would have stole that one because they really didn't play it very well. And Michigan kept you know EJ Perry turning the ball over in the red zone, kind of kept St. Louis alive to make that little Marcel Aitman comeback at the end. Uh, and then the final one to bounce off or bounce off of that uh, Panthers contenders question mark. Ooh, that defense is really good. They're running back. They're like Houston in a way because they have a big time running back in West Hills and they have a big time defense. The question is the quarterback is kind of spunky. Like he's a good runner and he's tough EJ Perry, but he can't play like he did last week. I, I Michigan has some moxie to him. If that quarterback can straighten out, um, and, and, you know, I, and their offensive line played okay, although St. Louis, I think, kind of won that battle at the line of scrimmage. Uh, Michigan has a chance. They'll, they'll be in every game. They'll be in every game. They have, EJ Perry's got to play better, though. Otherwise, you know, if they stun Birmingham this week, I think you got no choice but to respect them. Um, you know, if they go to 2-0 and and they beat St. Louis and, and Birmingham in back-to-back -back weeks and stop those offenses, then you have to, like, tip your cap and say that, you know, the, the Michigan's for real, especially on defense. Uh, and then bonus one here before the last. Do you like the UFL, USFL, UXFL, the whole conference, keeping track of all the wins and all that? I'm not surprised by it. You knew this would be a part of this whole thing. I get it. Part of me, like I try to look at things from every different angle. You know, these I get the argument that these two leagues, they should be united. we got to stop this crazy bickering we've been doing the last few years. I think there's a bit of a complex on the USFL fan side. I kind of understand it a little bit because their their games had no fans in attendance. They had the fake piped in crowd noise. People, a lot of people were loyalists to the XFL league in 2020, and they were like, you know, just waiting for the XFL to come back. So the USFL fan has felt like disrespected. So of course they're going to hang their hat on 
you know, hey, we're just as good as that league because people are telling them, like, you know, the XFL has more fans. They have fans, organic fans in attendance. The XFL had more players sign in the NFL. So they hear all this talk. It's just one, mind you now, it's just one week, right? So I know Birmingham beat who I think is the fifth best team in the XFL last year because Seattle was better than Arlington last year. DC was obviously better than Arlington last year. St. Louis, they didn't make the playoffs, but they're seven and three. They're better. And even the Houston Roughnecks who faltered at the end of the season, they were better overall than Arlington. They just, Arlington won two games at the end. So you got a 64 yard field goal from Bates and you got Birmingham beating the fifth best team from the XFL last year. I know they were the champs, but they weren't the best team in the, in, in the XFL. So it's just two games, you know, it doesn't end after this, but I think there's a chip on the, the USFL loyalist side because they felt like they were being belittled or treated as if they didn't count or if their league was inferior. That may, maybe people won't like it, but that tribalism is going to be a part of this. If there was social media back in the 60s, um, NFL fans back then were crapping all over AFL fans, calling that league a gimmicky league. And then so when the AFL came up with Joe Namath and beat them, finally, that it was like a badge of honor. In the 90s, I remember the NFC used to win. It felt like every single Super Bowl. So I used to remember the discourse back then where NFC fans were just saying, the AFC shouldn't even be a part of our league because the Bills get to the Super Bowl, the Broncos get to the Super Bowl. They're not going to win it anyway. It's all about the Niners, the Cowboys, Washington, the Giants who won multiple Super Bowls. So the um, world changed a lot in the next decade or so. But so this tribalism, I get the people on one side that are enjoying it. Um, I get the people that don't like it and don't think it's necessary. I hear the arguments. I'm not surprised by it, though. If you didn't see this coming, the league's playing into it, too. They could have easily not named the conferences, but they're playing into it as well. It's a storyline for 2024. Moving forward, we'll see. I just, and I'll say this a little, just my little thoughts here this deep into the podcast. Uh, I don't know if I've ever really talked about how – it, it's so interesting to me. Like you're talking about the, the, the USFL fans and all of that. I, to me, it's like the XFL was around and I was a fan, right? We weren't doing any of this stuff. You know, Paul and I went just to DC to, went to has fun. I mean, just to go drink and have fun and hang out, you know, I, you know, had, had a great time. And then when it went away and people were sad and then it's like, well, maybe it's going to come back. And I felt like even through, you know, like the spring leagues of it all and the fan control football and even the flirtation with the CFL, you know, I think a lot of us like we're kind of waiting for the XFL to come back, waiting for the XFL. And then, yeah, when the USFL came, you got a lot of people that went all in on that league that they, to me, I felt like you're not patient or you're trying to take this hot shot that's kind of we're upstarting in this kind of gap in the marketplace right now and you know you had the usfl podcast and you had all the, the usfl the media group whatever those guys call you know all the avatars and kind of all that stuff and like um then the xfl came back and kind of showed maybe how it's really done and yeah i i get that inferiority a little bit of that i mean at least that's my take is like you you, you kind of jumped off the wagon here at the one stop when we with the rest of us got to all the way to Oregon on the Oregon trail or whatever, if that makes sense. Now you're trying to, sure. I don't know, that's the I, that divide always came. I get it. Yeah, I get it, Reed. I, you know, here's the thing. Like I, I remember when the AAF came out in 2019 and the XFL had announced that they were coming out and the AAF beat them to the marketplace. Yep. This is back when I used to actually frequent message boards. Um, I remember AF fans talking crap about the XFL. Mm -hmm. I remember them saying, I remember them saying the XFL, Vitzik man, again, it's going to be a gimmicky lead. We already beat you to marketplace. They foolishly thought they had a relationship with the NFL because they were on an NFL network and they were, you know, Ebersol was selling that, Charlie Ebersol. So there were a lot of AF fans trash talking XFL fans saying, your league is not better than ours. We're with the NFL, et cetera. We're on CBS. Mm -hmm. What networks are you going to have? Vitzik man's an idiot. There's going to be a gimmicky league. All that. Look how stupid the XFL was in 2001. So there was tribalism during that. And then uh, and then there were fans on the XFL side. They're saying the AAF is not any good. No kickoff. You have no good rules. Your league plays awful, et cetera, et cetera. And we're going to actually have fans. We're going to have energy, all that. Uh, so I get it. What I find funny, too, with like the USFL is that like there are USFL loyalists that didn't even watch the XFL in 2020. There are USFL fans that don't know that the overtime shootout, XFL 2020. Oh, yeah. the, ex the tiered uh, extra points, XFL 2020. The clock rules, XFL 2020. Like all this stuff, 
the existence of X, it's funny how it worked, but the existence of the XFL in 2020 is what led to the USFL. Mm -hmm. You know, so it's like, so, and then a lot of the rules that you see. So um, there's definitely that tribalism. Some people like it. Some people don't. Um, it's going to be a thing. I think in week three, there's, uh, there's no um, outside of conference games. But this week we got two of them. We got the Memphis and um, San Antonio, right? And then it got technically uh, another uh, USFL versus XFL game with the Roughnecks, which is really the gamblers against the defenders. So, hey, if it gives USFL 4 0, you'll definitely hear it. The birdies will chirp. Uh, the ones that are on that side that kind of like want to say, I told you so. I told you either we're as good or better than you, we were always better than you. You can't really, even if uh, somehow the XFL conference teams win this weekend and it's 2-2, you can't really claim superiority. It's going to be a thing until Champion there's a champion that, crowned. Yeah. yeah so you can, you can, it's because right now half the team's undefeated and half the team is winless. So, uh, you know, I mean, like, so the, if one side feels like they'll never win a game, the other side feels like they're never going to lose. But that's, you know, after one week, you can't really declare anything. But if there's anybody who's questioning, who was questioning the quality of the USFL, um, they're mistaken to, to think that it was like a vastly inferior league um, because there are quality teams and quality players. We're, we're getting these super charged up teams now, too, with all these teams that unfortunately didn't survive. Uh, last question, and this is the theme of the episode, so we might as well actually ask this question on here. This is from Reed in Seattle here. Uh, the, uh, will UFL's extreme makeover save string football? Hmm. Yes. Is this enough? This, yeah. <laughs> yes, I, I think so. I, you know, I, I think this is our best chance. You know, the first article I wrote about in Sports Illustrated as far as the UFL goes is, um, you know, that I feel that if this doesn't work, Unless the NFL does their own league, which I, I'm old enough to remember when they tried that, and, and they had teams in Canada and all over the world and in the United States, San Antonio, et cetera, and it didn't work for them. Um, unless the NFL decides to do it, I think this is your last viable chance because look at the, look at the networks that are involved. It's extremely expensive to run these leagues. I think this is – I think what this, this league is going to be around for a while. So I think this is it. The, the, will there be somebody who tries to partner up with CBS or something like that and try to sneak into it? Sure, why not? Um, but I think this is your last viable shot to make spring pro football. And I, uh, I, th I, th I think they're going to be all right. I actually think if as long as these owners are fine with like, here's the thing, like uh, they want to make a lot of money. So um, if they got to have that mindset where they're going to hit a, if they're okay with getting on base, maybe hitting a double rather than hitting a home run or a grand slam, then this will be around. If they throw their arms in the air after two years and say, you know what, I don't think this concept's ever going to be the home run we thought it was. And then, then, uh, so I think there's a, this story has a lot of chapters left to be told. I think I agree with you. I think that, um, um, expectations have been tempered, right? I think egos have been checked. I think there was a lot of, you know, I think this, this you know, it's like, a, like a coming together as a merger or not as a merger, it's like a marriage or like, you know, when you got to work with someone in class, you don't really like, and you got to like, okay, we got to settle our differences here and kind of make this work for the, you know, for the common group or the common, you know, good of whatever. Uh, I bought what Daryl said, uh, Daryl Johnson, when he said, we realize we need to like practice what we preach basically like this is we're if we're in it for the players, we need to set them up for the best success. Right. And, and that's coming together and kind of, um, you know, lowering, you know, not, not fighting, right. Kind of coming together. I, I buy that. I, I take that, that they really looked, took, took a hard look in the mirror and said, if we're trying to do this for the player, we need to figure this out. And I like the United aspect of it. I like them coming together, joining forces. And look, the fan base is eventually going to join forces too, because when we get into the UFL off season, we're all going to be celebrating all the guys who sign NFL teams. Like it'd be something they had 111 players from the XFL and USFL sign NFL contracts. We'll all be happy when we, when we see John Trey Kirkland back in the NFL, Matt Corral back in the NFL, all that kind of stuff, because it's a validation of the league itself. So if they have 120 players sign, I can't, you know, it's not that you need to use the NFL name to show the value uh, of this league, but it does help 
that you know the success rate of players you hope that like this there are some superstars that come out of this league it helps show the value because right now we've seen people with their opinions out there they don't think there's anything special about the ufl like uh sims and all that for pro football talk uh talking about like how this league's not special they don't have special players so they do need to deliver on special players but i think there's a Definitely need for this kind of league, and I like the fact that they've united, and I think they can make this work. They're fiscally responsible. The question is, can they do enough things correctly to capitalize and to open up revenue streams? Uh, it's the same thing I ask about the CFL. Um, so uh, you know, you you I I root for the I root for these leagues. There's no doubt. I have no. I'm not a fan of any one of these teams. I don't care who wins and loses the games. Uh, that's a good thing, kind of for me, as far as being a media member. Uh, because I don't have to be a fanboy. I'm a, I'm a fan, though, however, for this league. Nobody has to root for the NFL. They're going to be around forever and ever and ever. I'm rooting for this uh, league to make it, to finally be the league that makes it and succeed, just the way I root for the CFL to stay afloat and uh, and get through the hard times and adversity and to evolve because that's such a tremendous uh, football league. And um, so, so anyway, that's just my thoughts on it. Uh, you know, though, when we start getting players signed to these leagues, it's going to be the, the USFL conference had X number of players. signed. <laughs> the XFL conference had this player signed. So, uh, that's so that, funny. Yeah. But you know, how that's, that's true. Going, you, know? you got a point. You got a point. I mean, I'm sure the stallions will lead the way. Yep, um, yep. we, we saw that like the stallions and the, and the, um, the battle Hawks had a, a ton of signings. I felt bad for all the other USFL teams. It's like the stallions had a bunch of signings and then all the other USFL, oh, we got three, we got two, I got four. And then the stallions are like, we got 19, you know? So it's like, um, you know, it's like, well, anyway, but, um, yes, Reed, you're right. You're right. I totally forgot that angle. Yeah. Anyway, with that, uh, we'll put a pin in it. I appreciate it, Mike. Hour and 20 minutes here. Check out Mike's Ooh. work on uh, Sports Illustrated. We're getting all that website stuff figured out. But follow Mike on Twitter. Post everything on there. Same with Anthony Miller, all the work that he does, both you guys writing, covering all that stuff. And again, Anthony was with us for the pre-show, for the kickoff and doing all that stuff. So really appreciate that. Uh, like and subscribe. Um, you know, to get us to 3,500 subscribers. <laughs> Eventually, eventually I'll be done talking about this. Mike, anything else you want to say? Yeah, congratulations, Reed. Like uh you've left the mark of positive one on uh on this space with your podcast and everything else. You have great guests on the show. Uh, you've done such a great job covering these leagues over the years. All the great guests you have on. Um I appreciate you and what you do in this space and what you've done. And uh, hopefully you get to that uh mark you want to get to in terms of subscribers and everything else. Um, but I, I appreciate what you've done, you know, um, and, uh, and, you know, and like, I think like your name sometimes could be a detriment, uh, Mark Cass. I've been on people call you Mark Cass. Oh, it's terrible. It's a terrible um, name. It's, terrible. It's, it's yeah, it's a terrible name because I don't think it does your show justice. You know, it's stuck now. It's the brand. You, there's no turning back at this point. There's a, um, I can't get into it. I was going to get into something else here, but I got to let it go. Maybe we'll off the air. We'll talk you will talk off air. But I, once again, Reed, thanks for having me on. I really appreciate it. Thanks to everybody out there who took the, took the one hour and 20 plus minutes to listen to what I got to say. And thank you for reading my work and checking me out at Sports Illustrated. Shout out to Casey Sager and Art Garcia, who do tremendous work at Sports Illustrated. Um, uh, they're just great editors. So I just want to say that. Yeah, no, it meant a lot. Thank you for all that. Uh, yeah, when Evan and I were at Texas Live the Friday night of the kickoff, we were having dinner, and you know, one of the league higher ups came over. Yeah, I saw this person in the thing. I go, oh, that's you know, they're here. Uh, came over and said hi to us, said hi to Evan and I. So I appreciated that. It meant a lot taking the time to come to me. you know, like, hey, Reed, it's good to see you here. And then again at the at the kickoff, they said, oh, you know, hope are you coming out to any more events? Hope to see you out here. So. You know, I mean, they, I think it's the beard, but at least they can they can spot me from across the room. So I uh, appreciate it. Like and subscribe. Uh, we'll see you next time. And uh, thanks. Thank you.